You can change focal lengths from a close up to a two shot. During yeah, let's your, call her the shot a little. During your question, <laughs> but not during Rodriguez's answer. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. And they get a single reverse cutaway of me. If, you know, so we'll have time to do that. And what I'll, we'll, I will try to do is I will try to get in here real fast right after your last question and get both of you. Okay. As she says in the note. Okay, right. Get a couple of them. Okay. Uh, you know, just. Okay. Do you want to. One, two, three, can you hear me? That's good. good. Are we gotcha. focused? Got it. Gotcha. Got it. Anytime. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, uh, Paul, you call yourself a, a Chicano, and that, that's synonymous with, with Mexican American or Mexican? Well, that's what uh, that's one of the things I talk about on stage. I might do it for you. It's, uh, it's my theory that the fundamental problem with Hispanics in this country is that we can't agree on, a, on, a, on what to call ourselves. Uh, in East Los Angeles and parts of Arizona, we're Chicano. In uh, Texas, they're Tex-Mex. Uh, in, uh, in Chicago, they're Latino. In uh, New York, they're crazy. And uh, so consequently, consequently, we battle over such insignificant stuff as to what to call ourselves, you know, Hispanic Americans, Latino Americans. I, um, I'm comfortable with Chicano and I am aware of its roots. I'm aware that it was originally a derogatory term, but uh, I think uh, the more I use it and the more other Latinos who are known use it, the more it's cleansed, the more it's baptized, you know. It's baptized into Chicano. What's wrong with it? It's See, I, I also believe that the unique thing about uh, uh, especially Mexican Americans in America is that we're basically in limbo you see um, when we go to Mexico we are we're not Mexican you know we are pochos so that is, that is to say we are people who who our parents ancestors left for whatever reason to come to America uh, we were not you know we're not patriotic we, we escaped uh, that country but deep down in the recess of their mind they envy us you see and uh, and when we're here in America, we're really not American, you know? So we're in some kind of limbo, you know? So how does your humor reflect that reality? I don't get up in the morning with that responsibility. You see, I, um, I've been the victim and also the, the receiver of a lot of uh, compliments. I don't ever read my reviews in the paper because they can never be right. I'm never as good as they say and I'm certainly never as bad as they say. So. Uh, I try to tell uh, Hispanic Americans that I'm not their Moses, you know. I'm not building an ark for all of us to go somewhere. They should just take me as I am. I am just a, a comic, a comedian, with no more weight or no more uh, significance or insignificance by that matter than anybody else. I am not a leader to Latinos. Uh, the leaders are Chavez, the leaders are Cisneros. The leaders are educated people. I don't. I don't presume or want that post. So then, are you are you a crossover comic? You've been called that. You know. Do you sure. agree with that? Do you object? That's one to of. That? <laughs> that's one of the nicest things I've been called. Uh, you know, crossover. What really does it mean? Uh, I'm comfortable with it if they mean that uh, that I am able to do my nonsense in Spanish, which I am. You know, I'm able to. I guess I'm one of the only comics who's actually been able to travel internationally. Uh, you know, I, I played Venezuela. Uh, I just played Puerto Rico this year. Um, I played the Old San Juan Hotel where where they they told me, you know, um, my friends in Los Angeles said, oh, you know, Puerto Ricans aren't going to like you. You're Mexican. They're not going to like you, you know. Uh, I'm, I guess uh, in my last life I was from Missouri because I'm more of a show me. You know, why wouldn't they like me? I like them. I didn't do nothing to them. So I went down there and the owner said, well, the first show it's for the tourists. I want it all in English. The second show I want it all in Spanish. I said, well, I, fine. I said, you know, you got the check? Is it cleared? Is it legal? I'll give you what you want. You know? So who is your audience then? My audience, I think, are just people with a sense of humor. I don't really look at my audience as an ethnic thing. I realize that that Latinos make an effort to come and see me, and I am infinitely grateful. But uh, sometimes they're the first ones to tell me after the show, 
hey, you didn't do enough Spanish stuff, you know? Well, that's because there's Ma and Pa from Tacoma here, you know? And and uh, it's, it's ironic. Some of the shows that I've done, I, I've garnered a certain audience. Well, I did the Newlywed game for a year. I hosted the Newlywed game for a year, right? And out of that, I got a following of elderly women, elderly white women. I remember I headlined in uh, in uh, Trump's palace in New, in New Jersey. And I always like to peek at the audience from the back to see who's there, you know? Because you can learn a lot from an audience. You can learn their, most of the time you can learn their sex, more or less their age and their ethnicity, you know? I say most of the time because, you know, it's different in some cities. But, uh, but I was surprised. There's a lot of blue-haired, older, retired ladies there who had thought uh, that, that I had just been born. They never heard of me before until the newlywed game, you know? So I play to them. I play to whoever's out there. So what are the challenges involved in, in, in making that adjustment, you know, in your writing or in your performance? Communicating. Really, communicating. You know, I can go up there and use very, very hip language that only Mexicanos would understand. That would alienate anybody who's, uh, who's Hawaiian, Asian, it would el eliminate anyone who's not Mexican. So what I try to do is I, I try to apply by the oldest rule of traveling, and that is when in Rome, you know? I'm here in Seattle, I will look at the audience, and I will, uh, I'll talk about things that, that everybody can relate to. I'll talk about growing old, my parents, uh, my views on the political, uh, you know, my jokes on the political thing, you know? Uh, but I really don't go on stage with a, you know, I don't have like a, a, a pocket full of jokes, you know? I, uh, I go with the flow. What do you want your audience to feel? What, what are some of the feelings that you want them to have when they're experiencing you as a comic? First and foremost, I want them to laugh. I will do anything to get a laugh. There is no such thing as highbrow humor or lowbrow humor. Laugh is, uh, is the only thing that distinguishes human beings from animals, if you really think about it. Uh, tears, animals cry, you know, they feel pain, their eyes will water up. I don't know of any animal that actually laughs. You could say, well, how about the hyena? The hyena actually doesn't laugh. It, it cackles and it sees a, a dead uh, bison and it, ah, it goes nuts, you know. But it's not, laughter is a, is a human emotion that, that is not duplicated. I want the audience to laugh, you know. I don't want to feel like I stole their money. They paid good money to come and see me. They got showered, dressed hopped in their cars, paid parking, you know. I want them to laugh, it's my responsibility. What do you want them to do? Is there anything particular that you want them to do after they hear what you've got to say? I want them to walk away with a feeling that, you know, hey, you know, if, if this Chicano or Mexican or Latino is like most of them, them, then they're okay, then they're good people. I know whether I like it or not, I certainly represent. Uh, I have acquired a post, an office that I didn't run for or asked to be elected in. And, uh, and I know that the responsibility is heavy, you know. I, um, I get thousands of letters from children after these shows that I did on, on, on another network about gangs and prison and that sort of thing. Thousands of letters from school teachers, kids and kids going, you know, you're my hero, you're this and you're that. I'm quick to tell them that I don't want to be their hero because I too have my skeletons in my closet, you know? I mean, I, I tell them not to have any heroes who could possibly uh, break their, uh, their heart, you know, because it could happen, you know? I mean, I'm very, it, it could happen to me, man. I can get drunk and get into a fight in a bar. I mean, it's not something that I'm planning to do tonight, but it could happen. And I don't want some kid to be going, oh man, I thought you were this or that. Well, don't think anything of me, you know. Have your mom and dad, if they're decent folks, and put you to school. They're, they're, them there is your heroes, you know. What are the primary themes that you like to cover? Like kids, kids seem to be one. You've done some stuff you yeah. know, around, around that. You know, what are some of your other favorite themes and why? I think uh, I like to lend my, my name and, and my energies to poverty. Uh, I'm not one of these liberals that goes around and thinks that government should uh, should just give you free money because it's a sin that you should be starving. Uh, I'm the kind of person that 
I do believe in a strong work ethic. I guess it comes from migrant farm worker parents that I have, you know. But I also believe that it is ironic to live in this country with such wealth and such tremendous possibilities and to see basically homelessness out there should be outlawed, you know. Um, it can be done. Uh, I am no, certainly no econ economist, no genius. I don't understand the workings of, of big finances. But I do know that every country in this world has their hand in our pockets. Russia's about to get 28 billion and all the, the American inner cities are being uh, destroyed by lack of education, poverty, drugs, infinitum amount of problems. And then all, all that the administration is giving them is a billion dollars. It's a recipe for, for, for defeat, you know? It's, it's suicide. Let's go back um, to, you know, the early beginnings of, of, of Paul, the funny person, Paul, you know, Paul the comic. You know, when did you realize the power of humor? It was the only thing I could do better than anybody else in the barrio, in my neighborhood. Uh, the strongest, the tallest, the handsomest. I wasn't the anything. I was the funniest. That was my secret weapon. I used to read comic books a lot, and it's a good analogy. Every superhero had a strength and had an Achilles heel, had a strength and a weakness, you know. Uh, Superman, the man of steel, but his weakness was kryptonite, you know. Uh, you had the, the Green Lantern had that ring, you know, as long as he had that ring, he was powerful. Without that ring, Cato could kick his butt, you know what I'm talking about? So I found out what my power is, and my power was the power of words. Very powerful thing to have. Uh, the power of communication, the power of, uh, of getting a thought across, the gift of, of humor, you know? So that's what made me survive. This is a true story. I once convinced a guy not to stab me by making him laugh. Absolutely. His name was Duro. Duro, and I used to go to Ralph Bunch Elementary, and this little sucker was going to stab me. And I started to talk. I started to talk and I started to do this routine about how I was going to bleed all over his new clothes and how I was going to be a mess and what a difficult thing it is to get a stain out. And at the time I remember there was a, there was a, a, a commercial about the, the Ajax white knight that used to come dun, da, 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 and I used to go, hey man, you're going to stab me man, I'm going to bleed all over you, There's, you don't see no white knights, we're in Compton here, there's no white, no, this guy folded up the knife, put it in his pocket, and told me to get out of here, you're a fool. You know, since then, you know, you're, you're, has your humor undergone uh, significant changes? Like, um, was there a time when you said, or when you were more comfortable with being called like the, the Chicano comic or the Mexican comic, you know? And it seems, it sounds like, you know, things have changed for you as, as, as you've progressed in your career. I think, uh, I think people can get hung, too hung up in, in titles and uh, see what happens is that uh, the public the people out there in TV land they need a hook something to hang their jacket on you know they need something that distinguishes you from somebody else if you mean I am Hispanic and I'm also a comedian yeah I'm fine with it you know my problem is I never hear anybody going you know Jackie Mason the Jewish comic uh, you know Robin Williams the white comedian you know uh, I don't hear, I don't ever hear, you know, uh, Bill Cosby, the black comedian. I mean, I know he's black. I, I know he's funny. Uh, but, you know, maybe maybe there's a lot more I have to earn already. I ain't in no hurry. Hell, I got the best job in the world and I got no bitterness, no complaints. Uh, people often come up to me and go, well, you know, you're not as famous as Freddie Prince. You know, he had a hit series. Hey, I love Freddie Prince fine. I know Eddie Murphy and I appreciate his humor fine. I know most, I, I am proud to tell you, I am probably good friends with the who's who of comedy working today, not only in America but in Latin America. But what I want these people to know is that the competition is in your mind, it's not in my mind. I don't wake up, I, I don't wake up every morning and going, you know, if I can just be Robin Williams, and, you know, if I can just be Eddie Murphy. You know, there is an Eddie Murphy, there's a Robin Williams already. I'm trying to be the best Rodriguez I know how, because that's good enough for me, you know.
What's in the works for you? What do you got going now? This year, it, it is, is as though, it is as, this year it has been a, a, as if God has had a little time on his hands, the war in the Gulf is over, and, uh, and he's taken a, a, a kind look at my life, and he has answered a lot of my uh, prayers, you know. Uh, I have offers, uh, like the song says, uh, offers coming over the phone like crazy. I'm producing a two-hour special for your competitors, ABC. Uh, I'm co-executive producing. I'm, uh, this is not to say that I'm the only one producing. I'm co-executive producing. Got the who's who of Hollywood to deal with the fundamental problems, which is education. We're talking about Danny DeVito. We're talking about Schwarzenegger, Madonna. I mean, it, the who's who. Uh, Isaiah Robertson's going to tell a great story about him and his mother and how he promised his mother he'd finish school. So I think education is really the bottom line as to the, all our social ills. You know, during these riots, we didn't see any people with PhDs or jobs out there looting, you know. It was all the hopeless, the people who had nothing to lose. That's what we should be afraid of, to, to have a whole generation of children. What really makes them be dangerous is that they've got nothing to lose. Man, what, I kill you? What happens to me? At least I get a roof over my head in three square. So I'm doing that. I'm producing a movie of the week for NBC. I just finished a movie with Whoopi Goldberg. I'm producing an hour special for Fox. Just you name it, man. It's been wonderful. You talked about the, about the situation in LA and the riot recently. Yeah. How does a comic find humor in something like that? Absolutely easy. Absolutely is the easiest thing in the world because uh, because comedy and tragedy are, are next door neighbors. There wouldn't be one without the other. It's the balance. You can't have fire without fuel or oxygen. You know. It's it's the same thing. How you find humor in something is you find the irony of it all. You find a, a, a black man uh, being beaten by the police on videotape. You have a white uh, uh, jury in Simi Valley who have moved to the suburbs precisely to get away from that sort of thing. And in their minds, they weren't seeing the actual beating. What they were seeing is, is their own prejudices going, well, he must have done something. You know, he had it coming. But you see, the Rodney King incident is, is no different. It happens every day somewhere in this country. You know, the, the incident in New York was over a, a Hispanic, a, Domini a Dominican kid who got shot. Everybody in the suburbs is going, well, what's the big deal? He's a drug dealer. They found a gun on him. Well, you don't know that. I don't know that. We hear that the police found a gun on him. And that's rather convenient. Now I'm here to say that it's possible, but I'm trying to tell you is that that I don't think that white Americans sit around and purposely set out to teach hatred or to be bigots. I don't think no child is born a bigot. What happens is from the lack of information, it happens because we're human. You know, it, it was a white lawyer who screwed my father out of his compensation when he broke his back. But for that, I should hate all whites? No. It's a lot easier to hate all lawyers. You know? <laughs> and, and in that, I think I can find whites who'll go, right on, buddy. Right on, pal. I'm with you. you know? Let me give you one more. Uh, a kid wants to be a comic. You know? You're a role model. Hey, you know, Paul's a good comic and he makes people laugh and he's wonderful. What would you tell a kid who wants to be a comic? What advice would you give him? Well, it, it's a. Uh, it's not a great career. For every Paul Rodriguez, there are thousands of, of Jose Gonzalez's out there who won't make it. I mean, it's you go to Hollywood every day, I see busloads of Hollywood, busloads of people hopping off in Hollywood with a, with a knapsack and a bunch of dreams. And these are the kids that wind up being prostitutes, wind up getting into the seedy side of life, being taken advantage of. I would say this. Certainly get a career, you know, I may seem like a fool to you, but I am educated, I did go to college, um, get that, get that, and then, you know, if you're, if you have it in your mind that, that you want to be a comedian and nothing else will do, then get your butt over there to Hollywood and uh, hopefully you run into me and I'll see what I can do to help. Gracias.
You bet. All right. Could we get? Uh, can we just get a sure. shot, uh, another shot? Sure. You could stay where you're at. I'm drinking. Do you want the light over there? Yeah, it? I'll move it. Okay. So how do you like Seattle? Like the weather? Cool. Rain. From what I've seen. <coughs> yeah. So yeah. Is this your first time here? First time ever. Oh, really? How did how did you uh, how did you know, how did you get managing this thing? Still raw. Have you yeah. had heard about it? Have you heard your your fellow comics you were talking about? That? Oh yeah, I've heard a lot about it. I decided to come here for one reason. That now, now I can say that I have been to every state in the United States and every major city in that state at least once, and most of them twice. All I don't. You know, my father says I've been up here before, but not in this business. We were up here in Bremerton harvesting uh, apples when I was eight years old, my daddy says. Because, you know, we travel all up and down Oregon and Washington. My only, my memory of Washington is... So it was over in the eastern part of the state. That's really where they're, where they're located. Tacoma or that? I heard well, the other some in Tacoma, but most of the Mexicanada is over there in, in eastern Washington in a place called the Yakima Valley. The Yakima Valley? Yeah. And that's where it, uh, I interviewed Cesar Chavez when he came about five years ago and said, Cesar, you know, not Cesar, you know, Mr. Chavez, uh, what are you doing? Are you, you know, here doing some union work or something like that? He said, uh, no, I'm just here, you know, visiting. Three years, uh, three years later, they had a union. And he, was, he, was, he was even sooner than that. But he was over, he was over on the other side of the mountains. Quite yeah. Cool. What do you have you listening? Okay. All right, just tell me what you want me to do then. Okay. Yeah. Just nod and go, yes, Paul. Yeah. Yes, Paul, you know. <laughs> you know, Paul, that's the attitude. <laughs> that's it. That's it. You got to laugh. You know, them lawyers who. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, it's been a blessing in the sense, you know, my parents were migrant farm workers and, and I'm sort of a migrant farm worker and, you know, I see a correlation in that because I go around state to state harvesting lambs. I just can't box them. I can't put them in a, in a crate. And, and you're looking at... You guys are talking oh. again. What the hell is going on? It's a rally, man. <laughs> you guys are talking. We're talking. I'm telling him stories. I'm going, well, I remember my first routine, man. My first routine was oddly enough about a woman named Eula Love. She was uh, shot by the LAPD in 1971. And it was very controversial. She was shot 18 times by two police officers. The woman was carrying a butter knife. And look, I'm no Hulk Hogan, but I don't know a woman in the world who could kick my ass. Well, maybe that girl on Gladiators, right? With a butter knife, you know what I mean? <laughs> These are two LAPD officers. The joke was, they shot this woman. Okay.